Thanks if you want to ask you about the trip, Doc. See how you're doing. We've been uh, experiencing a number of advances in terms of taking the club atmosphere uh, and bringing it to the masses by way of the web. And I think that this is one of the most dynamic ways to give the party, the true party atmosphere uh, in the most real sense. To be able to reach so many people through the World Wide Web, I think it's such a great advance of uh, you know technology. And I'm just happy to be a part of anything that wants to move forward and advance the music and bring the music to uh, as many people as possible. I'm pulling it up. This is drama. It's one of the sacred grounds for the music. I mean, it's where, where, where it started. So, Richie, when I mention the Detroit scene, what comes to your mind? For 10, 15 years of my life, that's what comes to mind. You know, uh, it's the uh, kind of have a, has everything to do with who I am now and, and, and where I've come from. The whole history of uh, Detroit techno started. Uh, I, I, I suppose you could say from um, Kevin Saunders and Juan Atkins and Derek May. I think uh, we were like way ahead of our time, totally. like 10, 15 years. Juan had this vision of what he thought the future was all about, what he thought life itself should be projected as in the future. And he, he we became friends and it, it was just, it was his way of thinking, you know, and it was really fast forward and it was interesting and it was something we had never uh, never seen before in our lives man so we all went to high school together me Juan and Derek Derek learned from Juan basically which um, I think started for him in 70 maybe 79 with uh, a group called Cybertron Derek started putting out music so for some reason I just felt like I had to put out music too One of the most influential, I think, to a wider group of people at that point was The Wizard, who was on radio, and that was, you know, otherwise known now as Jeff Mills. <laughs> Jeff had a radio show five or six days a week, half an hour, about half an hour, 45 minutes, probably around 9 o'clock at night on WJLB, the biggest, you know, urban station really Detroit had or, or has. And he was just pumping out the crazy stuff, hip-hop, public in, 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 you know, enemy to Derek May, to Kraftwerk. How would you define um, Detroit techno sound? Um, minimal, minimal, um, very funky, very soulful. How do you infuse soul into machines? Hey, you just gotta work them. <laughs> you gotta work them like they've never been worked. We live in a city that is very industrial. We have seen decompose, the decomposition of, of the city, and we've been able to relate that into what we've done with our music. Motown, was there any, um, did the fact that Motown was here? No. Okay. 
Now, Motown, you know, um, I mean, any kid that's from Detroit obviously has um, been a part of, you know, the, the, the surroundings of Motown. The industrial view of Motown and how to make records, and then the rebels from Motown like, like Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and um, Norman Whitfield, who were able to, to change the face of what Motown was as well as the face of music. And it kind of opened up our, our views and made our, our mentality uh, broader to be able to relate to the me mechanical music of craft work or you know the the strangeness of of visage these influences along with the development of house music coming out of Chicago all had its influence on Detroit. When this music came out there was a club called the Music Institute which is where most of the Detroit sound was uh, being form formed and produced and you would hear that sound at that club. In some ways a poor excuse for a club and, 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 the, and maybe standards there. There wasn't really, there was no bar, there was no alcohol, there was no, you know, like flashy lights. It was like a strobe light and one hell of a system. And it was just like, it was, well Derek had a track called The Dance. And I don't know what, what, why he recorded it, why I called that, but that's what it was all about to me and to a lot of people back then. It was like going into this dark room and just losing yourself. culture really that was generated out of a black crowd and a black scene here then got co-opted by like white Brits. Why do you think that happened? The British press. <laughs> Blame it all on the British press. As fascinating as it might seem, we don't have any idea how that happened. We don't know. Of course, we had this association and this real attachment to black soul music, but uh, we had more infatuation with what was going on over there. So when it jumped, it seemed almost like maybe we wished it, or maybe somehow we, maybe somehow we subconsciously made music more for for them than for us. Overall, it, it was a good thing. You know, I don't, I don't feel ripped off. I think it was just a, it was just a, uh, the, 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 the process of evolution, more or less. Derek would make a record, then I'll get excited about making a record, when Juan would make a record. We all get excited over each other, and, and it would be like a, a competition also, because we all want to have the hottest record. And we have people coming in from France and from Japan and from Switzerland and from the UK, all coming in and doing interviews saying, wow, this is a great record, and da 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 da. And immediately they would go to KMS because well, they have an area that they call Techno Boulevard. Right. Because at one point, KMS, Model 500, which is Juan Atkins' label, and Transmat were all in the same general area. In fact, the buildings were all kitty corner from each other. Originally, downstairs here was the studio for um, Juan Atkins, for Metroplex. And upstairs was my home and studio. Right. Now it's just my home. And downstairs is a recording studio and an office. And, um, you know, we've turned this whole block into, it's our block now, it's a transmat block. We miss, I mean, KMS is not there anymore, really. It, 
it's sad, you know, because we really always believe we could do something here in the city, but we've never really had the support of the, of the community. It's, it's, it's just not here. Detroit was just like the rest of the, uh, of the country. Um, you know, the mainstream uh, media and, and, and audience had, had no idea that, you know, uh, they had people that were flying overseas and, you know, uh, right in their own backyard, you know, and, and doing things and being recognized overseas. I mean, they had no idea of that. We've done some amazing things, not just myself and my guys, but the Underground Resistance guys, uh, various people in Detroit have done all kinds of things. And let's be realistic, that, you know, the U.S. is still, it's still a lot of racial barriers in, in, the, in the U.S., and I think that I think that there's a lot of a lot of that probably also that played a, a role in uh, us not being, uh, I guess, more uh, popularized. I didn't know what this music was, and eventually, when I went to the record shop and found these records, and then actually saw that it said Detroit, I, I was amazed because I actually thought it was from Europe <laughs> yeah you know and I did little did I know it was in my own backyard and that was just wow when I started traveling like for example to the UK in like 1993 1994 and I was meeting with all these you know various producers and the big name cats over there and they were just always used to the idea of a big studio even though they were making dance tracks just like we were and they were trying to figure out how to make their records sound like ours and we tried to explain, well, you know, we don't have all this big, massive, you know, 48-track, digital, high-tech, whatever. We did this back in the day before we had uh, all the uh, digital stuff we have nowadays, which is over there. I guess we could show the disco gear. That's what this was done on over there. The disco gear. In Detroit, it was real hands-on. It was in a lot of ways very low tech and it was really about grabbing the idea capturing it and then just moving on you know and trying never look to look back the culture of this music is um, very DJ oriented it's, uh, the culture is about Putting two records together, but making something new, experimenting with it, using effectors, using whatever, um, as well as the majority of the music that's that's being made in techno and drum and bass and et cetera, et cetera, is all um, music that is created and fueled by DJs or people who have a DJ mentality. One of the Detroit secrets about this record and many other records um, is the um, fact that this record could be played on a, on, on a different pitch by electro DJs in Detroit. Sped up on 45, it works in an electro DJ set. That's a Detroit phenomenon that's unique only to Detroit, pretty much. Because of the elements from which the music developed, it, it, it kind of added its own identity to it. And a part of that was being limited on equipment and limited on big studio. I mean, I don't have a big major studio now. And when you put, put the needle on the record for a, a typical Detroit record and another techno record or another record from outside, that's what kind of grabbed you. You know, mm. it, it, had, it had, I guess part of the humanity was, was still left in there. It hadn't been too computerized. This record is a worldwide phenomenon. It's actually one of the bigger, bigger, and biggest 12 inches that have that has come out of Detroit in a while. Well, the EP is called the Knights of the Jaguar EP on Underground Resistance, produced by Mad Mike and uh, Rolando. There's some sort of fight going on with Underground Resistance and Sony Music right now. Yeah, What's up with that? Yeah, there's actually been um, a trance cover version of the song that we're listening to at the moment. Um, which was played note by note by um, some German producers, I'm told. And um, there wasn't an agreement to um, actually pursue that. And what's your stance on the whole Jaguar track versus Sony? Uh, we just want to say to all you motherfuckers out there, 
gonna fake the funk and it's not right to steal so, you know, it's bullshit. That's our stand. But technically they can do it. But it's a diss. And it also says um, basically that, yeah, we ain't coming to y'all, we ain't gonna sign y'all, we don't want y'all, none of y'all. And that's just the way it is. And that's a, that's a hard, real reality that we all must face. That if we're gonna continue to make this music and do what we do, we will simply be blueprints and we will simply lay down new roads for others to travel on. Because they're not gonna let us ride the roads. They'll let us build the roads, but we ain't gonna travel those roads. Not unless we build our own cars and make our own way. Honestly, I don't believe has a sound any longer. I think Detroit techno is just modern music, and it's been able to to grow past what was considered electro or considered technology music. It's it's like modern blues or modern soul. Detroit producers, all the techno DJs from Detroit, mm -hmm. they all play house, house as well as techno. Right. House music is is just blown up big time, and um, we still sell a lot of techno, mm -hmm. but primarily we're concentrating on house music. Unfortunately, a lot of the younger producers that are coming into the scene view techno as being a European thing. They're looking at uh, the prodigies, the Fat Boy Slims, Crystal Method, all these various groups and influences that come from the European side of things. Uh, and then they say, okay, wow, I want to try to incorporate what I'm doing to sound like that, which I have no problem with, but the the, the thing that gets lost is the Detroit element. Ten years ago, you had one big party, everybody was happy. Now, you got the kids want to get their little piece of the pie, and it's fine, but, you know, there's been you know, altercations on account of that, and it's just gotten crazy over the years. When it first started, parties were nice and cheap, and it was all about the love, love of music, the love of people. Nowadays, it's, it's all about making money. When I started, it was major the majority were the white suburban kids. But now, you know, there's more of, uh, you know, the African Americans and the Hispanic Americans that come. But they don't really come for the drugs as what most everybody wants to think. But they come to hear the DJs. They come to hear the music. I almost feel like we're at the point now where it's like the prologue slowly like coming to an end and the first act's really about to begin and that's what we're going to see over in the next couple years. There's three or four places that have opened in the last few months alone and several more to come. Detroit is one of the leading cities in America for, uh, for electronic dance music. Uh, I think that Detroit is going to always be checked for reference uh, to what is going on at the moment. I think the biggest thing that's finally happened in Detroit and I think it's all cities need to go through this, is there's now developed, there's actual, there's an intelligent dance music crowd. There's people that have, you know, went through the whole raver thing, you know, the parties and everything when they were younger, and they still want to be into the music, they still want to go out and dance, it's still their passion, but they want to 
do it at a place where they can go and drink and at a nightclub. Half the reason we get the attention that we do is because we are the techno club in Detroit, which means for that reason alone, all eyes are on us simply because of the work that people did before us. You know, what these people have done with the music over these years and the way it's branched out across the world, that sort of instantaneously created some sort of curiosity than what must the club be like that does that in Detroit. And so it's what we try and live up to. The internet is the biggest phenomenon concerning techno. Um, that's the worldwide force and phenomenon behind most of uh, electronic music and dance music as we know today. As a music journalist, who are the people that are making waves in Detroit right now that you think are, are uh, special? Kyle Craig. Without a doubt, Carl is the only genius I know. And what he's done just in the past year, you've seen him make a major push in not just, you know, taking the music further um, with his Inner Zone Orchestra, honestly trying new things and succeeding and taking it all over the world. He's like helping organize a big music, electronic music festival in May at our Heart Plaza in Detroit, and I'm really excited to see what goes in with that. I'm just uh, a student of all styles because I try to keep my mind as open as possible. You know, there's some things I can't stand, whether it's country west western or something. But you know, there's th a lot, a lot still to be learned within within that. You know, whether it's that or uh, music that they'll play at a Greek strip club or something. <laughs> I always be Detroit. I mean, you can take you can take you can take the boy out of Detroit, but you can't take Detroit out of the boy. So you know what I mean. I'm gonna always be a Detroit boy. And that's the basics of the basics of what little bit I had of the song.